morning. Okay, everybody, good morning. I think we're live streaming, so good morning. Don't say anything you shouldn't say that you don't want heard. But welcome to Shoalhaven Baptist Church. All those of you who are at home, hope you're enjoying your time and uh, trust that uh, it'll be a great morning for you. Uh, we're looking forward to the future, of course, when we can meet at 10 o'clock for our Sunday school and then have our worship service at 11 and sing and do all the things that we like to do. But for now, we're doing adult Sunday school class at 11 o'clock in the morning. So if you're not here and you want to be here, do come along. Um, Steve Wallace has been doing uh, Exodus. And so uh, I think we're into our third lesson. Is that right, Steve? Third lesson. So uh, follow along at home. I'm sure you're going to learn something. So Steve, won't you come? Thank you. Thanks, Pastor. Yes, third lesson, so uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, let's pray first, and then we'll do our memory verse. So let's open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you that we can be at church and back on site. Thank you that we can study your word. I pray that we would learn some things today and uh, take on some lessons and uh, things we can apply personally. pray you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, memory verse. So uh, we're getting towards the end of the month. Should have just about memorised this one by now. It's fairly long, but uh, we have long ones and shorter ones. So that's the way verses go in the Bible. Sometimes they're a bit longer. Let's go through it twice. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Once more. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7. All right, so if you can say that next week, uh, chocolate rewards are available. We check the box. There it is. Check the box this morning, so there's chocolates in there, I presume. If not, we'll stock up before next Sunday. But uh, learn your verse. That's the most important thing. All right, our theme for this uh, series, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. So keep that in mind. That's where we're heading towards uh, a great Bible type that shows the cross and the power of the blood of the Lamb. Lesson three, uh, God remembers his covenant. So first two lessons really is about getting Moses ready to the point where he can go and confront Pharaoh. The right time in the right uh, approach and it uh, took a while, but Moses, after 80 years of preparation, is finally ready. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, and he took 80 years. Uh, God remembers his covenant and the verse that we'll uh, have to remember is Exodus chapter 6 verse 5. I'll just look at it here. Uh, and the Lord said, And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So the covenant was the uh, great... Uh, aspect that the Lord referred to. This is why Israel had to be redeemed out of, out of Egypt because uh, there was a covenant that said that they would be. They had somewhere to go. They had a destiny. All right, let's uh, read a bit. So Exodus chapter 5 is where we're at. If you want to turn there, uh, I'll read because you're all masked up as regulations require. You won't get away with it after December 1. You're going to have to read. All right, we'll, uh, we'll just go through the first uh, five verses, I think, is what we'll do. All right, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, 
that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye Moses and Aaron let the people from their works get you unto your burdens? And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you make them rest from their burdens. So we have that first confrontation, and we'll read a little bit further. Oh, the lesson application. Uh, during their oppression, God called the Israelites to remember his promises because God always keeps his word. So we need to do that too. This is a, a lesson in uh, remembering what God has said to his people and expecting him to do what he says because he will. And uh, even when things are troubled, even when uh, it doesn't look like it's going to occur, we do need to remember that God will uh, be faithful and he will do what he said he will do. All right, a little bit of uh, geography, just trying to show you a few things here. So I'll just get out of the way a little. Um, I've got a pointer. Good day. So there's Canaan. That's where the patriarchs were uh, before Israel went into Egypt. And uh, there's the Sinai. So Mount Sinai is about there. Midian's about there. And this is the Delta region for obvious reasons. And uh, in Genesis, that was the capital city, Memphis. Uh, and then the Hyksos came in and now Tanis, also known as Zoan in Psalms, is the Hyksos capital. That's Goshen there and um, they're building cities about there, Pithom and Ramses. Most of the time that's the Egyptian capital, Thebes, also known in the Bible as No or Nof. Um, and the Hyksos had driven the native Egyptian king down into this area and uh, they dominated up here. So this is where all the action's happening, mainly there. And uh, Israel will come down here, then cross the Red Sea a little bit later. Uh, so there's some uh, Bible references there as to these places. But um, keep in mind, we're, we're in that area there. Okay, so Goshen's there, Zoan's there, that's where the Pharaoh is. So that's where Moses goes. This is uh, the location of all that. Okay, there he is. Uh, he's gone into Pharaoh and um, he said some things. And Pharaoh doesn't look very impressed. Who is the Lord? Who are you guys? What's going on here? Why aren't you guys making bricks? All right, now think about it from Moses' point of view. Uh, he, got, he ran away 40 years ago and they were going to kill him. And he's gone back and uh, maybe they're going to kill him again. Well, you don't get killed again, but maybe they're again going to try and kill him. So uh, he is probably somewhat intimidated going into the palace to confront Pharaoh. And there's a definite limiting of the message. If you look at what God had told Moses to say and do and what he actually says and what he does, there's a, a difference, there's less in what he actually said and did. Uh, Moses learned from this experience that you don't cut down God's message. And he later wrote in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, You shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it. That's one of our church memory verses. So you don't change God's word. If God tells you to say something, you say it. If God's got something in his book, you don't change it. You don't cut bits out. You don't add to it. So uh, any ideas what was missing? If you remember back to the previous lesson, what didn't he mention or what didn't he do? The signs. Did he throw the rod down on the ground and it became a snake? Did he do the leprosy thing? Did he turn water into blood? No, he didn't do any of that. Uh, did he talk about Israel being God's firstborn and threaten Pharaoh with the death of his firstborn like God had told him to do? 
No. So he definitely left some things out. Now what happens when God's people don't obey God's word, when they give a partial account or do something that compromises the message? Well, basically it emboldens the wicked. The God, God's people don't have the power. The wicked have the power in the situation. And we see that here. God will not bless those who shirk from delivering the whole message, regardless of how popular or unpopular that message is. Now we see this in our day. Uh, we've been seeing it for quite a while. It's been going on probably since the middle of the 19th century, where preachers, for one reason or another, are less and less willing to give the whole message, whether it's the gospel, whether it's prophecy, uh, whether it's any number of topics. And uh, our independent Baptist churches are the standout on this issue and that's why I go to an independent Baptist church because you get the whole deal. You used to get pretty much the whole deal in most Protestant churches, but you don't these days. There's a diminishing of the message. They limit the scope of the doctrines they're willing to preach and I found uh, when I was back in evangelical churches they were great on the gospel. They were pretty good on the gospel but they didn't preach much else that was worthwhile these days I don't know what it's like they also distort biblical themes they uh, talk about the health and wealth gospel so if you become a Christian uh, God's going to make you healthy and wealthy which is not biblical just ask Job uh, others preach that God is only love now we know that God is love but God is also holy and if you don't have the two in balance, it's not biblical. To say that God is only love and would never send anyone to hell, that's not true. Others talk about uh, how you feel. It's all about <coughs> how you feel. So in short, these preachers tell sinners what their flesh wants to hear. And they fulfill prophecy. It's interesting when people fulfill prophecy without even realising what they're doing. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 says, The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now, if Australians would endure sound doctrine, the independent Baptist churches would not be able to pack the people in. There would be so many people coming to us. But they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they want to hear these things. They want to hear a cut-down gospel. They want to hear a health and wealth message. They want to hear some psychobabble nonsense. This is what people are itching to hear. And so, hey, if you're a, a young fellow on the, on the up, on the make, wants to make a name for himself in the churches, this is the stuff that you're going to be presenting um, if you have no conscience. Anyway, back to Moses. His limited message hurt Israel. And the application to the present day is the same. The limited message has hurt Australia and uh, hurt the churches in that people are not hearing what they need to hear. People need to hear straight-talking preachers who preach on sin, salvation and hell, that's the basics, along with the whole balance of biblical doctrine and practice. Amen. And uh, the Apostle Paul gave a charge to the Ephesian pastors his last time through that region and uh, he was coming through on a boat and Ephesus wasn't quite where the boat stopped so they came down to meet him they went on a bit of a, a walk down to the port and he met with them on the beach and he spoke to them and prayed with them and he said this to them uh, for I've not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God so I didn't take some bits and uh, leave other bits I gave you the whole thing take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. So preaching feeds the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Interesting point about God having blood in that verse. Of course, Christ is God and Christ's blood was shed. But the main point is that uh, the whole counsel of God, Paul told them everything he was supposed to and he was faithful in that and he was telling them, you guys need to do this too. But Moses didn't do that initially. He shrank from that uh, task that he had 
And it's interesting that Pharaoh responded with bold satanic defiance. Because the man of God didn't give the whole message, the wicked one flared up and uh, got very aggressive. Uh, Moses had no spiritual power in this situation and the Lord had to straighten him out. So what did uh, God say to Moses? Speak thou unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say unto thee. That's Exodus chapter 6, verse 29. So we need to uh, take heed as well that uh, any sort of cowardly, compromising Christian just makes the devil and his people more bold. What did uh, Pharaoh say to Moses at the end of verse 4 in chapter 5 here? Get you unto your burdens. So um, I'm not going to listen. Go and work. And that's what the devil wants, doesn't he? He wants people working, working for salvation. All right, notice something else in verse 2. What does Pharaoh say? Who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. What do you call someone who says, I don't know if there's a God? Not quite. An atheist is someone who says, there is no God. An agnostic says, I don't know, which is a cop-out, really. So here we have an agnostic. Pharaoh is an agnostic. Uh, and he says, who is the Lord? I know not the Lord. I'm not going to obey his voice. Uh, however, he makes one of the great errors that all the uh, worldly powers tend to make. And um, if, if you want to see a great worldly leader crash quickly and terribly, just watch them do this. He deliberately provoked and insulted God. And Hezekiah saw this as well when the Assyrian king turned up outside Jerusalem and started, uh, sorry, his general started uh, insulting the Lord. Hezekiah went, well, that's it. We win. Because uh, once the worldly leader does that, you know that uh, they're not going to last long. What does he say? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? And this is gross defiance against uh, God's commands and uh, the agnostic says I don't know but it's actually I don't want to know the agnostic does not want to know who the Lord is because that would require him to respond and once he has to respond then it gets a bit serious doesn't it if the agnostic can say I don't know who the Lord is I don't know about this uh, I'm not interested then he feels like that's reasonable if he knows who God is and then rejects as the, well not even the atheist, but if he knows who God is and then rejects, then uh, that's a whole different matter. And I think people understand that deep down. The natural man doesn't want the Lord in his life and the sinner's wicked heart is the root of the problem. Where does the fool say there is no God? In his heart. What's that? Psalm 14 verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. Not in his brain, in his heart. He doesn't want there to be a God because then there's implications, consequences. The real issue with the agnostics uh, is the claims that God places upon them. You need to repent. You need to get saved. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice, said Pharaoh. To say I know not the Lord is really a refusal to know God. And in our day and age, it's the surest way for a man to be damned to hell. Don't want to know about it. Don't talk to me about religion. That's what we normally hear. And uh, that's tragic. All right, so uh, Pharaoh's in the box seat. He's got the, uh, the whip hand, as we say. And what does he do? He hurts Israel. He really sets out to hurt Israel. He's already got them as slaves. But what does he do? He makes the job more difficult. No straw. So this is uh, verses 4. 6 through to 23. We won't read that for time's sake, uh, but you can have a read of that at home. But uh, he's cut Moses down to size and now he cuts the straw. And he lashes out in satanic fury, really. Uh, he sabotages the very work that he wants the Hebrew slaves to be doing. You guys are to make bricks for me and make these treasure cities, Pithon and Ramses. But I'm not going to even give you the materials you need. You need to get the materials as well, at least some of them. So, and then he blames them when they can't do it. He sabotages the work and then blames them for not keeping up. And he sets them an impossible task. They've got to put straw into the brick, which makes it stronger. 
uh, but they've got to go and find the straw first and then make the same number of bricks. So if you think about people who are probably about pushed to the limit anyway, making these bricks, and then they've got to find the straw first, it becomes impossible. And then he goes on to insult the Lord further. Verse 9 says, Let them not regain, uh, regard vain words. So Moses, you've come in here and you've made demands in the name of the Lord. These are vain words. Israel, don't listen to this. So you can see the way that uh, the devil divides and conquers in these sort of situations. However, God's words are never vain words. And this tactic of uh, driving a wedge between Moses and the Israelites did work initially, but... The Lord's hand was in the matter. It wasn't going to work forever. Uh, Israel actually tried to fulfill the, the command. They did try to make the bricks without the straw or get the straw and make the bricks and keep up the tally, but they weren't able to do it. And so the uh, overseers, the Jews who were overseeing the rest of the, the Israelites, were beaten and they went and complained to Pharaoh and uh, he said, no, no, you're lazy. You guys aren't working very hard. That's why you can't do it. And they saw they were in a very difficult situation. And uh, his spiteful reply to their complaints was, you're lazy, work harder. And that's the same reply that the devil gives to any religious man, isn't it? Do good works, work harder, do more, give more. It's the devil's plan of salvation. Work, 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 work. Perform as many righteous and religious works as possible. But we know this does the guilty sinner no good, does it? Romans 3.20, By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And we can see later that uh, grace and, um, must be sought in faith through the blood of the Lamb. How does Moses feel at this point? Basically, uh, Pharaoh's rejected him, rejected the message. He probably was lucky to get out with his life. And now all the Jews want to kill him as well. So uh, here we have this prophet that's completely rejected. Well, guess what? That situation normal, really, isn't it? Most of the Old Testament, the, uh, the prophet is completely rejected and dejected a lot of the time. Israel's in a worse situation and they're blaming Moses for that. Um, there's a saying, though, the night is always darkest before the dawn. And uh, this severe disillusionment would eventually uh, give way to a wondrous freedom. Uh, Moses started the well-known universal prophet's lament. We can see that in verse 22. You might want to turn there. Actually, we'll read verses 22 and 23. So uh, Moses goes back to God in prayer and basically asks for an explanation. You sent me here to deliver this message and it's gone badly, what's going on? So let's read that. Verse 22, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? Why did you interrupt my comfortable existence as a shepherd in Midian for to come to, e to Egypt and then this happens? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. What was supposed to happen? He's supposed to let them go, remember? Neither hast, this is an accusation against God, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. You said you were going to deliver them. You haven't done it. What's going on? Uh, prophets are allowed to talk like that. I'd be a little careful talking like that yourself, but um, prophets do tend to get a bit of leeway because of the way that God uses them and bends them completely out of shape in the process. So they do, they, in the scriptures, they did tend to get the opportunity to complain and even accuse a little. So um, anyway, so Moses has had his say. So what does God say in return? Let's keep going. Uh, Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. 
And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments, and I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. And uh, here we see the Lord arises on the behalf of his people. And eventually the Lord will always arise to defend his people and to deal with the wicked. And uh, we can see that in Psalm 68. It says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. This is an interesting psalm that links the uh, time in Egypt and the exodus out of Egypt with the second coming of Christ. At this point in the exodus, it's time for Moses to see God arise. But say there, now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. It's good to remember that the Lord often puts his servants in difficult situations. Often when he called someone, the first thing that happened was a major problem. And then they had to show faith and uh, see how the Lord dealt with that. We get put in uh, impossible situations so that we can show impossible faith. And uh, what's the point of having faith if the thing that occurs is just run of the mill and ordinary? Uh, faith is best demonstrated in impossible situations where God does something incredible. And then we get the blessing, don't we? In showing himself mighty on behalf of Israel, the Lord demonstrated eight things. So I've put them uh, in a list there. They run from verse 1 verse through to verse 13. First thing is the hand of God, which is strong and irresistible. It's in verse 1. Second thing is the name of God, Jehovah. In our uh, King James Bible, it's usually translated as Lord with capital letters. So where you see Lord with capital letters, all capitals, that's Jehovah. And uh, if you do a cross-reference between Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and Mark chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, you can see that the Bible states very plainly that Jesus is Jehovah. And uh, Jesus means Jehovah saves. Uh, you may have heard of the name Yahweh, which is a different way of saying Jehovah. In the Hebrew, there's no vowels, so you can sort of say things a bit differently. But generally, those that talk about Yahweh, uh, they tend to be liberals, and they have a very different interpretation on the Bible to us. So stick with Jehovah. Thirdly, we see the covenant of God, redemption and a promised land. And God keeps coming back to this covenant. God must keep to his covenants. And he has a covenant with us too. I mean, what does New Testament mean? New covenant. This is the covenant in Christ's blood. We can see the compassion of God. He pities his children. Verse 5 in chapter 6, I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel. And uh, it says elsewhere that the Lord pities his children. Because he knows we're just dust. We kn he knows how feeble and frail and uh, he knows the fact that we fail at things and uh, we're not like him. We're not holy. We're not perfect. Uh, fifthly, we can see the faithfulness of God. I want to say in verses 5 and 6, I have remembered. I have a covenant. I've remembered it. I'm going to do this. I will bring you out. Verse 6 also shows the redemption of God, mercy for Israel and also the judgments for Egypt. There were great judgments that were brought forth on Egypt. Uh, point number 7, the people of God. Uh, people of God are free and they are heirs to promises. Israel in the Old Testament, believers, born again believers in the New Testament. Free and heirs to promises. You can look those up in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. There's a commission from God. God tells uh, Moses and also tells us some things. 
We had to testify fully and faithfully. We are witnesses. He was a witness to what God had to say. We are witnesses also of uh, the gospel, the cross, what the Lord does in our lives. And we had to testify fully and faithfully in the most difficult circumstances. Circumstances don't give us a reason not to testify. In fact, circumstances often make it more imperative that we testify. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron and gave them a charge. Verse 13. What's a charge? What's this about? You get charged by the police. That's not very good. But that's not what we're talking about here. What's a charge? A job. It's a commandment where you've got to do this. I'm ordering you to do this under the most strict and serious uh, circumstances. So if you're given a charge, you better do it by someone in authority that has the right to give you that charge. You better do it. So God gave a, a charge to Aaron and Moses. Look, guys, this time, tell, tell Pharaoh what I told you to say and do what I told you to do and do it all and don't miss anything. All right, uh, chapter 6 has a little uh, parenthesis or an insertion here from verses 16 through to 30. We won't read that, but I'll just make some points about that. It's a genealogy. Now, Pastor knows I like genealogies. Um, we've had some talks about genealogies over the years. Um, a lot of Christians kind of switch off when they hit a Bible genealogy. List of names, boring, why am I reading this? Um, I've had a number of Christians tell me they skipped the first eight chapters of Second Chronicles which is eight chapters of names. And it is a little involved, I must admit. There's a lot in there, though. So if you ever want to uh, do a, a deep, involved Bible study, get into Second Chronicles, first eight chapters. But here we have uh, in Exodus 6, the last part of the chapter, a genealogy. Now, let me put it this way to start with. All Scripture is all, like all of it, all the words, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There's other things it is as well, but I'm just going to focus on the profitable. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. So what's the implication there? It's in the Bible, it's important, and you should take notice. Now you read some things and go, how's that important? How does that relate to me? Well, the Holy Spirit will show you eventually. Genealogies in the Bible usually give us the family relationships of the main characters coming up in the next few chapters or even in the next few books. You see it time and time again. You get this genealogy and you can pick out a number of names in that genealogy that suddenly they become the next part of the Bible narrative. So that's one use. It's a practical uh, context-setting device. The genealogy shows us who these people are that we're about to start reading about. Okay, so that's, that's one use of a genealogy. They also provide treasures of doctrine, interpretation and connection for, that, for those who make the effort. If you don't make the effort, it'll just go straight over your head. You'll never get it. What does 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 say? Study to show thyself approved unto God. Be able to make those right divisions in the scriptures and the right connections. See how things connect. Very interesting and uh, can be very profitable. All right, so this particular genealogy gives us a little bit on Reuben and Simeon and then it really concentrates on Levi, which makes sense because uh, Moses was from Levi and a lot of what occurs over the next few books in the Bible is to do with Moses and Aaron and, and also others in the tribe of Levi. So, I've picked out some things. Let's uh, see what we can learn. Verse 16 tells us that Levi's tribe had three main branches based on Levi's sons, Gershom, Kohath and Merari. And they each had special roles in the tabernacle. Okay, so there was a delineation, uh, demarcation, is that the right word? For uh, jobs where you do that and you do that and don't 
don't you do what I do and I won't do what you do sort of thing. So there was a demarcation of the jobs in the tabernacle and it was based on the three tribes, okay, Gershom, Kohath and Merari. Uh, Moses came from Kohath. Uh, also tells us in verse 16 that Levi lived for 137 years. And it kind of explains how they got from when Joseph and the others went into uh, Egypt at one point and then a long time later they leave and it's only been a couple of generations. They lived a long time. Uh, Kohath, who was Levi's son, lived 133 years in verse 18. A bit on Moses' family. His father Amram was a grandson of Levi through Kohath and his mother, Jochebed, was a sister of Gershom, Kohath and Merari. Uh, she's probably a younger sibling, so being the same age as Amram. Uh, Korah, who leads a well-known rebellion in, I think it's the book of Numbers, in the wilderness where the earth opens up and swallows him and his tent and some others. Uh, so he, he met a terrible end because of his wicked rebellion. But his descendants uh, go on to be quite good. Their service to the tabernacle was exemplary and they were commended. So although the Korites started badly, their founder uh, was swallowed up by the earth, uh, the Korites from then on actually did really, really well. And uh, we find out who Korah was. He was the son of Izhar, who was Amram's brother. So Moses' father had a brother called Izhar, and one of Izhar's sons was Korah. So Moses and Korah are first cousins. So this rebellion wasn't just a political or social uh, rebellion. It was personal, it was family, close family. Uh, and lastly, Eli Sheba, an interesting woman. Her name means the oath of God. We've been looking at covenants, oaths. Uh, she's Aaron's wife. She's from the tribe of Judah. And uh, she's the daughter of Aminadab and the sister of Naashon. Now, if you turn to Matthew chapter 1, you'll find these guys. They're in the genealogy of Christ. Other interesting things about them, uh, Naashon's son was Salmon and he's one of the spies who goes into Jericho. Naashon was the prince of Judah who presented the uh, gifts of Judah for the tabernacle. So they had 12 days where on each day uh, a tribe would come and present the gifts for the tabernacle. When it was Judah's turn, Naashon did this. Uh, and his son, Salmon, married Rahab, the harlot of Jericho, because he was one of the spies that went into Jericho. And now uh, they had a son called Boaz. Ever heard of him? Married Ruth. And of course, King David came out of that. And you can see all this in uh, Matthew chapter 1. Eli Sheba was the mother of Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So she's the wife of Aaron, the high priest. And these other four are the priests. Of course, two of them get killed on the uh, first day sort of thing where they offer the strange fire. But uh, Ithamar and Eleazar did, did well as priests. And her grandson is Phineas, and he's the guy that sticks the spear through the, the nobleman of one of the tribes and the Moabite woman uh, to stop the plague that was about to destroy Israel. So uh, we see some interesting things here about Elisheba, the wife of Aaron. So there's plenty in the genealogies. Don't neglect the genealogies. There's uh, plenty to learn and there's often some doctrinal and uh, other lessons for you there. All right, so uh, Moses didn't quite deliver the message he should have and uh, God's people got hurt because of that. But uh, God's straightening the situation out and next time it's going to be different, very different. The, uh, the momentum of the situation shifts and Moses is in the box seat. Pharaoh had one go at being in the box seat and uh, he cut the straw. After that, it's all running Moses' way. All right, we'll look at that next week. So let's uh, close with prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we do thank you that it's, uh, when we do make mistakes, you, um, you do forgive your people, you do restore your people, you um, give us another chance. And Lord, we can see these lessons in the life of Moses. And I pray that uh, you'd help us to uh, admit when we are not faithful to your word or when we uh, mess up in other ways. And I pray that uh, you would show us how to make things right. Pray you bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.